and um, it is a Thursday, which means it's time for the really big class. Um, I'm so happy today to introduce my guest, Callum Smart, who I have yet to meet in person. We have met a few times online. Um, and our performers today are from, well, originally from the UK and the US, but are coming to us today from London, uh, the East Coast of the States and the West Coast of the States. So we've got uh, Connecticut and California. And um, Maya, I think, is in London. So we're, we're certainly from all over today. And Callum is actually in Boston today, I believe. He's, he's coming to us from the States as well. So welcome to the really big class, Callum. Thank you so much for being here. Oh, thank you. It's my pleasure to be here. I'm uh, so excited to hear everyone play. Um, before we get started, I just want to say a few words about, about you, about Callum, and, and sort of how I came to know about you. Um, I started teaching at the Royal Northern in, so hard to get years right, um, September of 2019, I started teaching there. And in January of that same year, I was invited up to the Strings Festival at the Royal Northern and um, to sort of see what the school was all about, get to know people, hear some performances. And I heard you play. I heard you play not once, not twice, but I think four times over the course of two days. Oh, and I didn't, <laughs> I didn't know anything about you. I, to be honest, I thought you were a student. Um, and I think you were finishing up sort of a post postgraduate international degree of some kind fellowship. And I was just struck by how, how your playing combines a complete technical mastery with an sort of an ease of musicianship and you really marry the two together. And I remember that then, and certainly as I've been following your Instagram, which if you don't follow Callum Smart on Instagram and you play the violin, you should, because he gives a tip almost every single day that will change your playing if you, if you follow his instructions. But you do the same thing on your Instagram. And as I've gotten to know your performances on YouTube, I'm struck by the same thing, just this, this uh, bringing together of the technical with the musical, which is, I think, what we all are striving for um, in our daily work and in our performing. So um, I'm very excited to, to have you here today. Thank you. Thanks. Such such kind words. <laughs> I'm not sure I can live up to all of them, but I definitely resonate with what you were saying about combining technique with the, the music and how they kind of hold hands. And um, although I definitely don't achieve that all the time, that is definitely what I'm always striving and looking for when I teach and when I play. Yeah. Um, just a few other things. I can't even imagine how many concerts you've had canceled um, because you, your performance career is just really, I think was ascending like crazy as this all hit, but you have a new album out. Do you want to tell us a little bit about Transatlantic? Sure, yeah. Yeah, a couple months ago, I released um, an album called Transatlantic. Uh, it's combining kind of English um, and American music. I'm half half and half. So um, I studied, for, for the, those of you that don't know me, I studied in Indiana. I did my, I did two diploma courses out there. So, and my mum is also American, so I'm half American. So I feel kind of very connected with both cultures. So it's just a kind of disc reflecting those experiences, really. But yeah. Fantastic. I urge you all to get a copy. Don't just stream it on Spotify. Get it in your hands. I think we should get going. Yeah, is everyone ready? So our first performer is Maya. She's playing two movements of Izai's second sonata and we'll share her video. This is the, uh, we've heard this a few times on the really big class, so it should be a little bit familiar by now. The Obsession and my favorite, The Melancholia. So here is Maya's video. Thank you. 
Bravo, bravo. That was really, really beautiful. Um, let me find you so I can pin you. Is Maya, Maya, is your camera on? I can't see you. Um, yeah. Oh, okay. Let me check. She's there. She's Maya. Hi, Maya. Hi, Maya. Great, great. Amazing. Really, really beautiful. Um, particularly the melancholy, I felt um, that you were very connected with it. Um, and I find your playing very sincere and very musical um, and lots of expression. Um, I think the thing that immediately stands out to me um, which you could look to develop is more variety in expression, particularly in what you do with the bow, particularly in the um, in the obsession, the, the very beginning in the Vivace. So um, maybe we could go back to the beginning, we can work through it a little bit. But I think um, what's also important, which I'm not sure that you've, you have quite come to terms with yet, is combining what you do with the bow with what you do in the left hand. Sometimes you give two different informations. In in left hand you give one information and in the bow you give something slightly different. Um, particularly when you have things like the accents, you know, that we combine that if, if we give an impulse in the bow, that we give the same impulse or the same feeling in the left hand because otherwise we only get half of what you're trying to say. And I can tell that you feel it, but um, as listeners, we don't actually necessarily get exactly what you're trying to communicate. Um, yeah, maybe we could start again from the opening and just kind of work through it. I think that this first line, um, to me, needs to, the whole thing I felt, it needs to have more energy. This, this, this movement is full of so much passion, so much energy, so much kind of, it's, it's very hyper in a way at times. And I think that, it was a little bit too calm. It was a little bit too melancholia. I think we needed much more contrast. So even in this very beginning, I would just end, you know, it has to be kind of really surprising. Like we don't know what's about to happen. We're expecting it obviously to go. So if you if you do a massive ritadando at the beginning, personally, it kind of takes away from the surprise. If you go. You're kind of already scripting what's about to happen. It's like, oh, look out! Can you make it, can you make it more of a surprise? So like, it really is a total shock what happens next. Yeah. Yeah, very good. The first half was good. Then the second half, your bow got longer slightly slowed down can you what if you keep the same leggero the same um sparkling quality to the bow all the way to the end just because you diminuendo doesn't mean the stroke should get heavier yeah it's <laughs> it still gets heavier Really listen to it, it gets slightly longer as you get quieter. Can you keep the same shortness? Ah, last note. Last note. Everything was perfect, apart from the last note. Last note went. Yeah, it's getting there. What what it's about? Um, it's about keeping the energy in the fingers in the bow arm. That's that's where it actually comes from. This stroke, this, kind of this collet stroke. See what what tends to happen is as we get quieter, our our kind of finger reaction tends to slow down too. So we, but even in absolute pianissimo, we need the same amount of energy as when we started. Try one more time. I think this is the, the time. <laughs> Very good. And then this this next section, um, we can kind of use this kind of fouette stroke, the kind of whipping of the bow, um, which, you know, like Jacques Thibault, the, the violinist who this was written for, was very famous for doing. And it kind of involves 
we, we come from the air. So it's much more of a kind of dramatic entrance to our up bow. And so right now you're kind of placing it very nicely. It needs to be, we kind of, as I said, it's like whipping, like it has to have that, that sensation. Yeah, it, it, to do that, we actually have to be very relaxed. If our upper arm is tight, it won't let us, it won't let us do it. We have to be really loose here. And then it's about coordinating that drop like that. Very good. And um, when you cross strings, just be careful that the sound doesn't become too distorted. Make sure that you don't lose the, the, the core to the sound. It's, it is brutal lament, but also we should still be able to really hear the pitches clearly. Yeah, it starts great, and as it goes along, it gets a little messier. So watch out that when you go to the bottom string. You know, we need to give a little bit more um, contact to, to the bow or something. You need to find a way. We can't play in the same way as we play when we start on the E string as when we go to the bottom string. So we have to find a way to adjust. Again, just use your ears to find that. You'll find it naturally. That's better. And, and strong. <laughs> Better, but you lose energy right at the end. It's the same thing with here. You go, same thing here. You, you've got to go right to the end. Right to the end. Better? <laughs> Sorry to be so picky, but on the very last note, you slow down. You slow down the bow. That's better, that's better. And then use the momentum of your arm to follow through. So if you go, you have to follow through. The, the gesture does not end on the string. The gesture ends in the air. Yeah, good, much better. Go on. Same thing there. Same, yeah. Same thing there. It's, it's good. It's good. But they're, they're two different worlds. And the way that you're playing it is very kind of studious, right? To me, it's more. It just needs to kind of like scuttle along. It, it, it's, it's really surprising that this comes after such a shocking reply, right? So if we kind of mark it and we speak it too obviously, then it it kind of doesn't really make sense. I think we should be able to make the association with this line and the very beginning line. So I think it's important to play them in the same vein. Like we have this one idea and then we have this brutal lament idea. So if we indulge ourselves too much, you know, we kind of lose what the, the actual point of this thing that we're following is. Last note, it's so good until the last note, which is always... <laughs> yes. And then, and then, forte again. Very good, very good. So then this is one of the places where I feel that your bow is doing one thing, but the left hand is not following with the bow. So you're, you're phrasing very nicely with your bow. But with your left hand, it's almost totally sensitive. And I don't know if that's on purpose or just because it's quite difficult. So you're focusing on the bow. Um, but 
in any case, in my opinion, it's nice to vibrate a little bit, especially the, the bass notes, to bring out the, the, the melodic line. <laughs> Instead of just see, it can it can suddenly sound very flat without, and I'm not talking like to really vibrate or anything like that. But actually, I don't like so much to use the word vibrato, but to use the word life. Your left hand doesn't have enough life. You're you're giving life and energy into the bow, but you're not reciprocating that into the left hand. So try from after the up the staccato and see if you can find a way to bring life to the left hand. Yeah, yeah, good, good, much better. Um, then the other thing in the bow, it's, it's one of the hardest things I think about this movement is the string crossings. Um, you know, one of the things that I think helps enormously with string crossings is to imagine that everything is played on one string. You know, instead of thinking about changing strings, imagine this is all played. You know, how would you want to phrase it? That's what's important. So. Instead, see, I, I feel that the string crossings slow down your intentions. Try, try once, I, I love to practice like that, to, to make make double stops with the line. So, yeah, try, try again. It's, it's quite difficult to do that. And what, what I feel sometimes people miss is it's not about just playing double stops it's about how you do that so you have to do it musically convincingly not just to play the double stops because obviously you can already do that what, what it's about is about finding the line finding the musical conviction to do that So, uh, so, see, then, then, then what happens is instead of giving gestures that you don't mean to give, we get an overarching gesture from your bow. So instead of da 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 da, we get bum 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 bum, bum which is much more exciting and more in the kind of vein of kind of what is being communicated in this passage. Um, yeah, let's let's go again from the same place, but now play normally. But just try and think when you go to the next string that you don't, we don't change. You know, we don't even need to change the arm level for such a short period of time as we play double stops. We don't go right, so we don't need to do the same when we have such short string crossings. Excellent, that, so much better, so much better already. Um, then when we get to this marcato section, we need to just give a little bit more articulation to the first note. It's marcato, there's an accent, it sounds a little like, a little bit fluffy. No, it's not a, not a happy theme at all. <laughs> um, also, on the up bows, when you have... Again, to think about the gestures that you want. Do you want to give the same gesture each time? Or how do you want to phrase this? Or maybe to think about how you want to 
to shape this line, then communicate that with your bow, so it's not all the same length. Um, should I do the? First yeah, sentence? yeah, maybe from yeah. <laughs> And um, very good, two things. You didn't vibrate one time on any of the marcato notes. I, I'm not trying to criticize, but I'm just trying to make you aware, was that on purpose? Um, I mean, I'm trying to do like a bit to sort of bring it out, but not. Okay, okay. So I didn't, I didn't hear any on the. On the... You you can also think about it in the same energy as the as the bow as, as what I was saying. Instead of obviously we don't want, to, but it's kind of just an impulse um, injecting that life. Um, yeah. The other thing is when you have then when it reverses, really try not to give an impulse on down bow because any impulse that we give on down bow is going to take away from the up bow. Really try and yeah, you almost have to like half play the down bow. Very good, very good. So a lot better already, I think. Um, again, make sure, even in piano, that the note has some bite. Otherwise, we don't. We're not able to discern as an accent. Yeah, I'm yeah, good, 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 much better. Um, I didn't hear the accents here. That's that's such an important, um, such an important detail. I think there. Good, good, good. So good, apart from the last note. <laughs> You'll hear it when you watch this back. It's it's so, so great. <laughs> yeah, that, that's great though. So much more colourful now. So do you see how our intentions with our bow, how clear we are with the information that we communicate, really greatly affects what we're able to express when we play. So... I would really explore that in this. It's kind of very repetitive. You can apply all the same things we just talked about. How much time, Cecily, do we have left? Ah, oh, you've got at least 10 minutes. Okay, great. Maybe we could move on to the, the melancholy, just make sure we cover both. So I found this, this was very beautiful the way you played it. I liked the tempo, I liked the feel. I feel that it could have more lilt to it. And what I mean by lilt is kind of a more kind of overall kind of shape to it. I felt at times it was a little bit too beaty, you know. So, uh, when, when these double stops come in. You know that that we um, we find a way that when we add the double stops, it does not affect our phrasing. It's one of the hardest things to do, I think, um, when we start adding different lines. I would almost imagine that you are playing this on the piano or something like that. When another line comes in, it doesn't affect the one we're playing. Uh, yeah, maybe we could start from the beginning. Yeah, very good. So, question. Um, in the second bar, when you have... 
Okay, so we have two slurs, right? We have two bows. So how many notes should we play in our bow? Um, I mean, I'm kind of trying to think of it as like an overall bar. So not, yeah, I'm kind of, I'm like, I mean, through the whole movement, I'm kind of trying to stop doing like so many swells, but like the bow change. Yeah, but. yeah, it's 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 difficult to do that, but essentially, yeah, when we have this. If... See, we don't want to mark when we change fingers. Sometimes when you change finger in the left hand, you also change in the bow. You know, imagine it was just an open string. See, it's very, very simple. Um, I think you need to, look, maybe we could try from the beginning. Can we try from the beginning? And can you mime your left hand? but just play the open strings. So pretend to play your left hand on the right, on the correct strings. Yeah, very good, very good. So what I hear is every time you get to the tip, you make a diminuendo. Yeah. Uh, now, I would wonder if that's on purpose or whether that's just happening because. Um, I mean, I'm kind of, I get a bit is fine, but like overall kind of try and um, like reduce that. Yeah, so, so I think, you know, just a kind of technical observation perhaps is that when you come to the tip that you feel that that we that we don't feel that down bow is down bow and up bow is up bow but actually that down bow has a kind of an end to it that goes up instead of ending down see because then we are always going to diminuendo instead of We save that beautiful diminuendo that you have that you're it's really beautiful when you do that but if you do it on every bow it, it chops up the phrase too much so we're going to that hairpin right in bar six that's that's our kind of destination in this first phrase so maybe you could start again from the beginning now um add, add all the notes and stuff but really try and aim for that that hairpin Yeah, very good. Very, very good. Already better. Um, when you have um, again, try not to, but but just one note, one note. Go with the lines, not the notes. Very good, much better. Um, the other thing is in the left hand, again, of course we don't have to vibrate all the time, but to really ask yourself, does it have life? I know I'm saying that again, but for instance here. And you, you had no vibrato, but more than that, though, it kind of fizzled out, the energy fizzled out. I feel that it still needs to have some life. Yeah. Even just a tiny bit or something that gives gives it that kind of sparkling quality. Otherwise, when we don't have that, the sound just kind of drops, the, the resonance drops. Yeah. 
good, 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 good. Again, watch out that the uh, the. It, it it's tempting because we have a shift to go to slow down, but try to keep the rhythm really. And then when we have this. That's where we're going to. So I wouldn't stop that. Don't start. Again, keep going, keep going, keep going. That we've got to have that feeling of progression over a very long period of time. So every time we diminuendo or we halt that flow, we lose that intensity that's building up. Yeah, very, very, very good. Um, you lose the intensity towards the end of the no. It just kind of dies away again. But both in the left hand and in the bow, really keep that. There's an enormous amount of tension on these suspensions. And here. Feel that tension stretching. Very good, very good. It's so much better. Um, so really be careful when you have duplets, or that you don't clip the second note. You know, for instance, here uh, you kind of swallow them. If you actually look, what happens in the in the bass voice? Now. So if you disappear completely on the second note, we lose the start of the, the next line. sustain that top voice Very good. I would. I, I think we need to probably finish. But um, what I will leave you with is to practice open strings and mime the left hand. You go the whole way through the piece like that, and you'll discover where you're you're articulating with the bow, where you don't necessarily want to be. And it's that will be such a valuable tool for you. But in general, uh, I really loved your playing. Very very beautiful. Um, hopefully this was helpful in some way and yeah, look forward to hearing you in the future. Thank you. Yeah. Bye. Thank you so much, Maya. And if it's coming across that beautifully on Zoom, I can only imagine how great it sounds in person. So hope to hear you very soon. I'm just going to follow up, Callum, with what you just suggested she practice. And maybe you could show us a way. I've, I have a way of practicing for portato that includes an open string. Mm -hmm. where you bow the string below what you're fingering mm, but could, nice. could you show what like what should she do with her left hand if she's miming it where should it be right so i mean let's take this take this opening for example right we have 
Then we have G string. So I would just put my left hand just above, just a little bit above the string, right? And It's more, I, I sing, you can probably hear my terrible humming or singing over the top, um, but actually it's so important to sing when you do it because it's about connecting with your voice. Uh, it's about understanding that we don't sing so we sing right so that's what I'm connecting with it's not so important to like be miming dropping the fingers that that's a kind of hyper coordination that's not really that important in this sort of setting what's important is visualizing what's happening visualizing the left hand visualizing the string crossings and making sure that you don't articulate the strings you for instance if we have that we don't hear just because there's a change of finger or there's a change of note of course that's not to say that sometimes we won't articulate with the bow or won't use portato which of course is an important expressive tool you know perhaps later i might go you know i might articulate with the bow but I feel that your your way of doing it is your it's your automatic is to is to do that. It's that's not because you're kind of using it as an expressive tool. But yeah, that's how I practice it. I, I think it's that's a really interesting way to practice it. And I I I think I remember doing the way, Cecily, that you mentioned, which is when you you play on the lower string and mime here. Uh, and I think that anything like that is really effective. Anything to get you to engage in making sure that you're not just doing something in one hand and then it's just having a knock-on effect in the other hand because so again I, I the best way is to sing really internalize that's great thank you for the clarification and for those of if anyone's watching who isn't a violinist what callum just did where he mimed what he was doing did it with the bow and sang it that's actually unbelievably difficult so um bravo i think the singing alone would be um would put me under so yeah. thank, you, thank you both for that that really is one of my Probably my favorite movement of Isai. I don't know how you two feel, but. Excellent. Um, next we have a piece that is somewhat new to me, although not new to, to the world, that's for sure. And not new to the class uh, participants because I got sent about 30 recommendations of recordings to listen to of the Elgar Concerto. And um, when Adi asked if he could play this in the class, I, I asked Callum and he, I understand that you have a performance coming up. Are you, this is a piece you played a lot. Could you just talk to us about the Elgar Concerto? It's a piece that I started learning around three years ago. I performed it kind of quite a lot in the last two years. Uh, I have some performances of it coming up, but it's a piece I feel very, very connected to. Um, it, it was a big project for me when I decided I was gonna um, program it with some orchestras. Um, I didn't give kind of any dates for like a couple years out um because i really wanted to take the time to get to know it and not only to get to know it but to get used to playing the whole thing i mean it's 50 minutes long for anyone that isn't that familiar with it it's an absolute beast of a concerto um and also the way that it's orchestrated is very beautiful but it's it's not at times the most sensitive orchestration um, in this particular concerto, at least my experiences playing it. So you have to really sustain so much of the time. Um, and it's obviously it's Elgar, so it's, you know, very, very emotional music, very sustained, very recitative. So yeah, that sort of stuff takes a lot of concentration. So uh, it's a piece that it took a lot out of me to learn, but it was really a rewarding process. And I continue. It's it's kind of everyone has that piece. Maybe that at the end of the at the end of the day or at the end of the week, they might even if they're not practicing it, they might go to and explore and kind of try out a particular passage again and see if it changed a month later or so. And I think that Elgar is that piece for me. So I'm really really looking forward to hearing Abby play. Great. Well, we've got um, just the first five minutes or so of the first movement, and this is Addy and his video. Thank you.
Bravo. Bravo. Thank you. Yeah, beautiful, beautiful. I really, really enjoyed it. Um, so, yeah, I think that you have a really nice openness to your communication. Um, very kind of warm, very sincere. Um, I like that um, I felt in the expansive moments you were able to really project that forward, which I think, as I was kind of saying a little bit just before you played, um, is one of the hard things about this concerto is being able to stretch it enough so that when the orchestra comes in, we can actually kind of float on top of that. I think maybe what could be there that maybe is not there as much right now is the concept of the, the recitativo in this music and the, the, the speaking quality in your playing. I, I, I'm not sure if you're familiar or you've heard the Dream of Durantus. I don't really know it. I, I know of it, but... Yeah, it's, I would definitely recommend to listen to it. Um, it's, I mean, not only a stunning, you know, cool oratorio piece of music, but also written before this concerto, and I think gives a lot of context to the type of characters and the type of spoken quality that comes from his opera that is translated into this concerto. Um, I think what you do with your left hand at times um, could be more intimate and more... Um, more of that spoken quality, you know, even at the beginning, I find sometimes your your slides or your, your shiftings, they're very expansive, but sometimes for me, they're a little bit on the slow side in general. And that can kind of elongate the note in such a way that I'm not necessarily sure is convincing all the time. Um, maybe we could go back to the beginning and kind of work through it and I can show you what I mean. But if you want to maybe just play this opening. So again, same thing there, the, with the, the shift up to the top, to, to me, it's it's just a little bit too slow to the point where I feel that it it gets away from the vocal quality almost. Like, it, would you mind, sorry to put you on the spot, but would you mind just singing this, this opening phrase? When you sing, did you notice the type of expression that you did from the D to the A? Yeah, it was a more, it was more kind of, it, it was connected, but in a different way. Yeah, like, the connection exactly. was shorter, but it was still yeah. There. It was it was very different to how you played it. It was faster, it was lighter in some ways, and it was much more connected to that top A. Can you try again and? Again, just because we were just talking about it, but because it's so important. Can you play, but can you also sing at the same time? Okay, I'll try to. It doesn't need to be the right note. It, it, it's more just the, the, the phrase than, than okay. the exact pitch. Wow, that is hard to coordinate. Let me try that again. I would start, are you starting up bow or down bow? I'm starting up. I personally would start down, but I would do two. Or you can do. And then two ups there. Or I don't know. It, to, to me, the, the first note it is immediately in that kind of rich noble mente. To start on an up bow. For, in my interpretation, it, it kind of feels a bit uncertain somehow, a, a, a gesture. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll give it a go with down. Yeah, give it a go. <laughs> I found that that shift, that slide, was much 
more expressive for me. I, I much prefer that to the first time. Then what happens afterwards, see, again, that it's spoken, it, you play it, a beautiful legato, but to me, it's separated from how you would sing it. I, I don't know. <laughs> It's almost so ironed out that it gets away from how we would naturally sing it. Can you try again and really just try and just speak it? Just try and say it. That beginning phrase was much better. Um, already, see that it's too thick for me. It's it's too juicy. The the sound. I'm not saying that that isn't a good thing, but to me, this moment is so tender and so intimate. And I'm not getting intimate from you. I'm getting incredibly open and expansive, which again is a beautiful quality that you have in your playing. But for me, this is not the moment for that. To me, this moment, you know, the orchestra grumbles, right? pianissimo piano there's nothing going on here in the orchestra you don't need to worry about projecting but i would find this this spoken quality also sorry just one more thing <laughs> and to say that um i think that elgar elgar's constant markings in this piece is very misleading and i think it can make the performer like constantly take tons of time or constantly like be messing around i i would try playing it once without any of the markings okay. find your musicality within that then do a little bit of what he says but to do so much it suddenly instead of feeling that <laughs> you know at the end of the day it's only a quaver it, there are any quavers it's tenuto, yes, but it's still a quaver, and it's pew tranquilo, right? But it's not kind of adagio. So yeah. I think just something to think about that it still has that energy in life, even in a slightly um, quieter and slower tempo. Okay. Let's try. <laughs> Yeah, better start. I would, for, for this reason, um, I would try a fingering that doesn't involve being on the A string, um, purely because I feel it's too open, you know. It reminds me of like this, this type of open feeling. I would try more, I would go up. Again, that, that feeling of like we're reaching upwards, we're, we're reaching this, um, you know, this dream of drums, as I was um, saying, is, is this um, kind of pious feeling, this feeling of searching for something above. I think it's very, very present in this moment. I'm just going to try taking off my pad. It's something yeah, sure. Okay. That would be easier. <laughs> Yeah, Again, it's it's pianissimo, dolce. It's so it needs to be so still.
great. So much better. So much better. And then when you go, it's like an explosion of passion. You know, I'm really, really then go for it. Da dum, da dum, ba dum. And then you know, it's it's a totally different, a totally different character. Yeah, I would um, try to articulate a little bit more that top bow. Just so it really, it really kind of pops through. Mm -hmm. yeah, very good, very good. Um, again, I don't neglect the small note. Uh, again, I'm not sure that's the right place for that. It, ju purely just because the syncopation to me is the more interesting thing. Da -da -da -dum, bum, bum, bum. So I would refrain from maybe doing a slide there. So, then this is kind of somehow less important to me. I know, again, these are just kind of my thoughts on the piece. There's certainly nothing wrong with what you did. It, it was very beautiful, but just for me, it, it's not quite fitting with the, the character at this moment. Yeah, so yeah, great, great, much better actually. Uh, lo lots of really beautiful things in there. Um, I think you can experiment with your left hand with how you communicate. So sometimes you tend to use for tame the same type of expression, you know, that kind of on the slow side slide, which again is really beautiful, but we don't want it all the time. You know, sometimes I. Uh, <laughs> that you need to do any of those but that you explore different timings you know that you when what you're doing with the bow matches what you're doing with the left hand sometimes you give a very slow slide in the left hand but your bow is giving like more energy or a more urgent message so just maybe try from this passage again and really try and fuse what you do in the bow with what you give in the left hand mm -hmm. Beautiful. It's so, so much more expressive. I don't know. How did that feel to you? It felt easier. I think I was so set on, because it says Largamento at this point, I was just kind of honing in on that. And yeah. That alone. Yeah. It feels freer now, which is good. Yeah. I think, you know, just getting, I, as I said, kind of overall my feeling of your playing is you have a very kind of sustained, really like ironed out um, sound, which is great but you need other types to add into the mix. It's a bit all that. And I think, again, that recitativo quality, you know, when we sing or when we speak, sometimes we release, sometimes we accent, sometimes we, we change the way we talk, we use different vowels, we use different, um, you know, um, ka, ta, you know, we use different 
appreciation. So to to really keep the sound so sustained everywhere, it kind of makes everything sound equal. Um, very very good. That was much more expressive. But the only place that was a bit funky was the the high note coming down to the G. But I think that was probably more just because I did a really bad <laughs> version and then made. Um, but yeah, that's good. And then again, be really careful with your left hand that when you shift, that we don't hear the shift just because you're getting from one note to another. But if you really mean for there to be an enunciation, so like. <laughs> You know, each one of those, it, it was too, too many in a row. You know, I, again, just be careful that the path that you're shaping in your left hand is intentional and not just to get from one note to another. Yeah, maybe uh, just from there, from around 11. Again, again, a lot of slides. <laughs> or again, just to think about the character that you want. To me now, the energy is higher. So to have such a kind of lethargic slide, I, I'm not sure. Maybe sing it once and let, let's see You know what you feel there. Uh... Yeah, yeah. I guess I'm feeling some kind of connection, but it is. Maybe I don't know if it's a matter of just like vibrating on the slide or something, or just lightening. Maybe. Try. It could just help in terms of lightening up the hands. Yeah. Hmm. yeah, that's it. That's it. That was much better because see now now you were connected. Now you were connected with what you were trying before you were just doing something. Um, now now it was good. Um, and then when you have this, um, I would personally do. I would do on E string. Now I I would sorry I, I, would, I would I I would slide up there personally. Okay. To me, that's the one that has the more, you know, the crescendo is written, it goes to forte, and it goes up an octave. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's very, very good. Much better. Much better. Um, when you have... Make sure this is... Don't release that note too soon. Yeah, re really important that, that that top note holds for long enough. It, you're kind of clipping it at the moment. Yeah, I'm a bit scared up there because I actually have like a weird wolf note between C sharp and D sharp. Oh! Like that. Wow! So I, I, and I don't know, it's only come up recently, so I'm just scared of that happening on that note. <laughs> okay, okay. I, I, okay, that's totally understandable. I've never heard of a wolf note that that's amazing. Maybe, maybe you can go. <laughs> um, but even so, uh, wolf note or not, I think I'd rather hear the wolf note and that you go for it than you half go for it and it sounds bad anyway, you know? Right. Yeah. Okay, I'll see what I can do. Much better. I, I didn't. I didn't. I didn't mind the wolf note at all. I I much preferred that. That was much more confident and just expressive. Uh, yeah, let's go on. Yeah, make sure it's clear. Uh, really uh, articulate on the way down. I I. I would do, I would do, uh, 
three, two, one, three, two. So you don't have to shift. Yeah. That's it. That's much better. Yeah, that's much clearer. So I'll try that one more time in context. Yeah, same thing, and also... Also with the, the top note, that we don't rush it. Um, Fingering-wise here, I'm going down to a four, but I wonder whether there's something... No, I think that's good. I do that. I just would release more your first finger. In general, I think, actually, and I'll say this because also maybe it's helpful for other people too, is when we're, when we're shifting down or when we're shifting up, I, I feel in general you have too much weight on your first finger. You know, that's why we hear the shift. And so, I almost, like, think about taking it off. And so, it's that, that first finger that weighs you down. Conscious of that slide, but yeah, that's good though. That's good. So yeah. can you can you hear it now that it's it's happening a lot? Yeah. Right. So here I don't know because there is an accent on the top note. Um, yeah. So I do want to grab it somehow, but I wonder whether there's a way of kind of sliding up part way and then just. Yeah, 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 yeah. This is this is. Uh... Yeah, this is what I'm saying, you know, there, there are many, many different ways of getting from one note to another. And I feel that you have your default way of getting there. Um, and you need to find hundreds of ways, you know. You know, there's so many different ways of getting there. Then you'll find one that fits the character. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, let's, let's keep going just so we cover enough. Make sure that you vibrate on the sforzando, not on the note after it. Okay, uh, the the first the first bar there's no writ, there's just tanuto. So keep going. Now again, see if it if it's too much, too much, we lose all sense of momentum. Much better, much better. Um, articulate more the accents. Now, this one. Oh. It's too, too legato, I think. So and again, here too, it needs more um, articulation. Really, really grab hold of the string here. Uh, where should I? And uh, maybe just because we're running out of time, maybe from. Okay. 
Okay. Uh, so, oh yeah. Yeah, very good. Much better, much better. And just try not to let your vibrato get too wide that it gets away from the pitch. You know. <laughs> really keep it within that pocket. It. Do you hear when it gets a little bit outside of? Yeah, yeah mm -hmm. that's very good. And then the next part. Oh, have we run out of time, Ceci? <laughs> no, you should talk about the next part. It's so beautiful. It's so beautiful. Okay, just a few minutes. Again, this is. I would love for you to work on this next part purely because this is exactly what I was talking about about the openings. Recitative, this incredibly intimate and special moment with the sound. You know. <laughs> And it was too, again, too sustained, too, too blue. You know, did you ever hear the singer Janet Baker? Yeah, yeah, I've heard some recording. You should listen to her when she sings quietly. She has this way of like spinning her voice where it, it's almost just like time stands still. And I think it's the best way I could use to describe this, just, just like time stands still. So find a way, whether it's with your vibrato or with your bow hand with the slides that you do of make us just stop for a moment it, it's, it was too obvious too open the way you played it before let's let's just try a few lines of it Much more beautiful, much more beautiful already. I really enjoyed it. Um, don't do a massive crescendo into 17. There's no crescendo written until this. Now, here, here. Again, this was another place where it needs to just take on a life of itself with the, in terms of how you speak with the left one. You know, when you have things like this all, oh. We need that that intimacy of the left hand. You know, it's it's a do do da da instead of do do da da. It's too too. It was too fat. <laughs> careful with the vibrato. Sorry. Yeah, careful with the vibrato that it doesn't get too fat. Much, much better. Be very careful with your razor. And to me, this place is absolutely calling out for. You know, that kind of like high fits menu and stuff. 
you know, it's, it's very appropriate. But yeah, I, I think we probably do need to stop um, as much as it pains me because uh, you play beautifully and I love this piece so much. But I would just leave you with discover the speaking quality in your playing, the recitativo. Listen to Dream of Drances, you'll see what I mean. There's a recording of Janet Baker singing this, which I recommend to everyone here. It's out of this world. Um, and I think it gives you an immediate insight into what this piece is about. But yeah, it was beautiful hearing you play. Thanks so much, Carmen. Yep. Thanks. Very beautiful playing. Thank you so much for doing this. And um, you'll need to tell us, maybe we'll have time at the end of the class. I have questions for you about what you're currently doing because you're not a music performance major, are you? No, that's right. I have never been actually. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I have done music degrees, but. In... Right. Well, let, let's save time at the very end because I have questions. So I'd, I'd love to hear you talk about that a little bit. Um, speaking of Dream of Gerontis, I just, because I, I'm slow, I just put two and two together with that. That was one of the last gigs I had canceled. I was supposed to, I was contracted to play it in a, um, a group that was going to do it on gut strings. Oh, wow. And record it in Poland. And that was the last of my my jobs that didn't happen. Um, apparently, it's going to happen in 2023 or something like that. But um, so um, I will absolutely listen to that recording you, you recommended. Yeah. Amazing. All right. So we are going to uh, hop over to the West Coast now to my old home and hear Chili Ekman play some Tchaikovsky Concerto. And I think if it's all right with both of you, we'll share this, the shortest section of this so you have time to work. So this is only about five and a half minutes of the finale of Tchaikovsky. And we are in for a treat because Chile was able to record this with a pianist. So we have, um, we have that, so enjoy. Thank you. 
Bravo. <laughs> uh, let me find you so I can pin you. One sec. I can't see how do I how do I pin Chili? Did you find him in gallery view, Callum? No, oh, I'm just looking. Ah yeah, got it, got it. Thank you. Great, found you. <laughs> yeah, beautiful playing. Um, really, really enjoyed it. Very virtuosic. Um, like everything's working really well, um, which is like, this is a really challenging movement and you made it seem very easy at times, which is um, to your credit. Um, so really, really great. Um, so kind of, yeah, from, from opera in the Elgar to kind of now ballet in the Tchaikovsky, I think, that you can embrace much more of the ballet element of this of this movement um you know from the kind of the the beginning or the, 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 you know, to this this type of thing i think you know it's a it's a question a lot of the time of articulations to me you articulate in such a way on certain notes where it kind of makes the music sit to give you an example you go every time and it just goes oh, it just everything sits straight away also um in the bum ba da dum ba 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 that has to be the most energized you know so try not sometimes it rushes it's that that um ba ba that has to be there the whole time. That's what makes it this music dance. Uh yeah, really good. Maybe we can go back from the beginning and uh, kind of work through it. Um, but yeah, overall, really beautiful playing. It's just kind of details how I see it and kind of bring it bringing it to life and making it smile and dance more. I thought it was it was too serious, <laughs> which I understand because you know from playing it myself, it it can feel quite serious work at sometimes. <laughs> yeah, let's let's start again. Oh, I can't hear you. Can everyone else see? No, that's strange because you're not muted. Um, is your microphone, did something happen with it? This is, it was so perfect before. Hello? Yes. Ah, there we go. <laughs> okay, uh, from the beginning? Yeah, let's go, let's go from the beginning. Okay. Yeah. So, so to me, again, it, the the last note needs to be more surprising. So here. Yeah. That last note, it needs to be much more kind of powerful. Again, this is the. It's really quite a way to start a third movement. It's so exciting. I, I'm not getting the energy. It's really well played, but I'm missing the, the fire. Yeah. yeah. I think also, if you make this too light, 
it takes away from the power. <laughs> You know, we will have time later where it transforms, but here I would I would keep it purple. Die, yum, ba da dum, bum, bum. Good, good, and again, and again, don't, don't stop. We've got, we still gotta go. <laughs> Into our into our dance, um, yeah, very good. When, when you have pizzicato, I feel that your your movement is a little bit restricted. Can you be more more? This is really this is like showing off. This is as show off as it gets. So physically, we need to we need to do that too. Okay. Um, you don't have to play the opening. Maybe from yeah. <laughs> important technique to learn how to lift the bird at the tip. You have to come back. Can you? It's, it's good, very good, very good. Of course, this is a matter of interpretation, but as you get quieter and slower, I feel that it starts to get very heavy. Um, mm. you know, to me, it, the energy is still there. It's just... Um, again, so to really keep that, that energy alive. Okay. Yeah, maybe try now from the beginning to, to the, the end of that and let's try and get that whole session. <laughs> That was great though, that was, that was all much better, yeah, yeah. yeah. enjoyed that. Yeah, I've been to... told that about the, uh, yeah. yeah, this is a habit, bum ba lum bum 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 Do you want to try from the, uh, the attempt? <laughs> Really keep that ba 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 ba. was so much better that really came to life now uh, now it really danced uh, it, and it, it just had a lot more energy and expression to it yeah amazing the difference articulations will make to the overall character and kind of impression yeah really really good um maybe from uh, somewhere some somewhere around there Yeah, 
don't, don't, um, yeah, this, this bit's so difficult, um, to play. Really? <laughs> Really try and speak that ending. Really try and uh, da 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 da. That don't don't rush it and kind of gobble it up. Okay. Um. That's it. Yeah, and you can use the bow to help you. That's it, yeah, yeah, that's it. That's so much better. Yeah, um, keep going, maybe. Dun, dun, dun. Next, next passage. Yeah, I, I, yeah, maybe, maybe. I, I kind of see it more, I kind of see it more thrown away. I know. Yeah, it's very, very active. You need to be more active in your fingers. They're a bit, they're a bit slow to, to react. Yeah, and, and again, um, try, try once playing totally legato. Yeah, that's it. And then all that we do is we just give the other. Yeah, that's it. That's it. So, so we have that impulse. We have that shortness, but we still connect the string crossing. Otherwise, we won't be able to. Otherwise, we won't be able to do it. Yeah, and again, don't don't rush. I would just end, you know. Bum, bum. That last note is only a quaver, right? Yugga, dugga, 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 dum, off. Because then the, the interesting part is. Right, so if you if you hold on for too long, it takes so it delays that that second beat. Okay. Yeah, maybe from uh. Yeah, that's that's better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And to try be careful not to rush. <laughs> yeah, and we can phrase it. And these these last ones, these last two, dugga dugga dum. I always articulate those a little bit more, so it's really clear for the orchestra. Yugga dugga 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 dum, bum bum, and then they always catch it. No, no problem at all. Uh, maybe from a... Yeah, try and kind of get that... I was, I was talking about it earlier with uh, the Yazai, the kind of fouette stroke. That we whip it a bit, otherwise we're never going to get enough power there. So we, we, it comes from above, we have to lift the bow, slightly. It's like a, we, we hit from above. So. so you keep the bow fully on the string. So there's no hit, you have to take it off. Very slightly. That's it, yeah. Uh, but instead of, can, we don't do this, but. So we hit the bow. That's it, yeah. Yeah, it's called the fuerte stroke. But we use it, it's a lot more powerful than. 
you know, it's just it, it's not an aggressive thing. It just it gives it that that pop. Yeah, and I would avoid going. What's interesting is so I reverse it the other way around. Maybe uh, try try that, and then we'll go on. Yeah, there you go. That's that last one. Boom. Great. Let's go on. Yeah. What, there's again. There's one note that is too long, and it kills it. If that note's long, again, it's it, we don't get that kind of Cossack character. Uh -huh. I think that was happening because I was doing it all on a down bow. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, it's, that's, yeah, that's why I do that thing. Um, are you cooking? Could do it on up though, but I yeah that I do split it for that reason. Yeah. Okay. Again, it's kind of just. I really imagine just someone has had like. 20 pints of beer and is, you know, going around like this. It shouldn't be kind of too sophisticated. You know, really, you have to envisage that. Imagine, it's, it's so clear, the ballet's set, on comes the, the drunkard. This is, this is what's happening. So, so it's very, it's very good. It's very well played, but I'm not getting the kind of drunkard quality. And there, there's ways that we can play with timing to affect that. Maybe you could try again and see if you can experiment with how you play, how you play it timing-wise to bring that out. It's comical, that kind of comical side to it. That's good, that's it's good. You know, these are kind of like drunken hiccups. Ooh. It shouldn't be predictable. It shouldn't the last thing it should be is predictable. At the moment it's a little bit predictable. Okay. And then same thing. Uh... And I, I personally don't do um, an accelerando before the tempo. Oh. Um, I, I know that some people do. Um, I, I don't like to. And for exactly that reason, to me, they're two very different characters. There's this kind of the strong man kind of, kind of wallowing. Now, right, it's, it's a very, a very different character. So for me, if you kind of already tell us what's happening five or six bars earlier, it's kind of cutting into a different yeah. character. Again, this is my opinion. I know a lot of great violinists that do that. I just personally don't agree with it. I've heard a lot of different opinions on that, but... Uh, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Uh, I think, you know, no matter what you decide, you have to invoke a character. At the moment, you're kind of in between two characters. So, 
something to think about. What are you trying to communicate here? It's like you start being expressive and then you're like, okay, accelerando. And then that becomes the only meaning. <laughs> there's suddenly no character. There's just, okay, he's doing an Excel now, but why and what's happening, you know? It's very good, very good. Just don't rush. If you played like that with an orchestra, they would not like you. <laughs> it was really terrifically played from a violinistic standpoint, but there was no chance an orchestra would have been able to follow that. Um, also, when you have, I, 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 again, this is purely personal preference. I feel it's probably unnecessary, but I do play. Did you ever try doing the octaves there? <laughs> I don't know. I I kind of like it. Um, I looked at it. It's very hard. Uh, it is hard. <laughs> yeah, I actually I don't do it for virtuoso reasons. Actually, I just quite like the effect of the octave and kind of how it transitions into the woodwind. Like I can imagine like a oboe or flute. I don't know, somehow like the octave quality really matches, but again, it's, it's really not of too much consequence. I, I, it works both ways, but don't rush and uh, really, really make sure it's clear for the orchestra there to follow you. Um, they will definitely slow down in this passage. <laughs> um, yeah, great. Maybe let's keep moving in the, the next passage. Yeah, I, I again. Um, da, 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 da. I think the 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 grace note can have more energy, you know. Nice. For someone that plays as well as you, really try to avoid things like this. It's it's when you play so well, it, it really it sticks out so clearly. Be careful again, like I was talking with Addy, don't let your finger drag to the next note un unintentionally. Just extend. You can you can do it without shifting at all. Extend the finger. Oh. Always ask yourself, how do I want to get from note to note? Yeah, don't just automatically okay, I have to get over here, so whatever noise happens, happens, you know, like, there's ways around that with, you know, extending the fingers and all of this, all of this stuff, but yeah, I think, I think we actually have to stop now to allow time for a few questions um, from Sassy, but um, really wonderful to hear you play, um, I would embrace the dance nature of this piece more, and with those articulation comments, and just in general, try to really evoke exactly the character that you want, but yeah. Great to hear. Yep. Absolutely brilliant, Chili. And what a delight. I mean, you make that, both of you make that sound just like the easiest thing in the world to toss off that that sparkling spiccato. And again, if it sounds that good on Zoom, I can only imagine what it sounds like in person. So thank you very much for joining us. Say hi to Ian for me. 
and um and enjoy the sunshine out there in california go eat a, a taco or a burrito for me and <laughs> and we have time i really wanted to save time for some questions so you all better have some um why don't we <laughs> pop into gallery view if you want and turn your cameras on raise your hands or stay silent in which case i will ask questions does anyone have a question come on i guess i have a question um so first of all thank you so much for all your guidance it was super super helpful um i have been i guess playing around with my setup a lot on the violin recently um just to get as comfortable as i can given the kind of playing that I, I do mostly orchestral playing now but um just given the kind of playing that i do and i realized that it's actually not as practical for solo playing in some senses because i'm not sitting down I, I mean i'm mostly sitting down when i play and when i stand up i find that actually everything stretches out which is probably not a bad thing even when i sit but i mm -hmm. find that you know i can sort of rely on maybe hunching a bit or having my head a bit further forward um i was wondering whether you had any advice on, I, I mean, I may change things again. I currently don't play with a shoulder rest. I have a tall chin rest, but do you, have you ever had kind of experiences changing your setup and what was the best way of sort of assessing whether one thing was better than another and mm -hmm. knowing like how much to change at once? Yeah, no, that's a great question. And I think like all violinists are constantly asking themselves like truly do I have the best setup I I think you can feel really comfortable but never 100% this is the setup because also our bodies change and you know depends on how we feel you know like environmental factors also sometimes play a part to setup I find um I have undergone changes I did used to try to play without a shoulder rest um it wasn't personally for me um I needed a bit more support. Um, a couple years ago, well, probably around four years ago now, actually, I changed to this um, Korfka rest thing, which I, I did. It is very expensive, um, probably too expensive, but I actually do think um, I can recommend it because it's adaptable. So if you play with a shoulder rest, it's something that can change to your body, um, which I find is very helpful. So I would say um, in terms of setup in general, I find... Um, not having to yet yeah, make any sort of compromises with neck position when you're standing up is really, really important. Like, I always try and find a position that if I take away my violin, I'm kind of would be in the same position. I think that's normally a really good um, sign of if like if your setup isn't quite right, if you take away the violin, like, are you doing something that you wouldn't just do naturally if you were standing there? Um, so, I mean... I think it, it really depends on what you need. I, I find it's never worth um, looking at somebody else's setup and going off what they do. I think it, it's such a personal thing. That's why I don't want to like advise anyone on their setup. It's so personal. The only thing I can say is there is definitely no such thing as too much experimenting. I, I don't think there's such a thing as too much experimenting. I would say if you have to perform then I wouldn't be experimenting a lot um, because, you know, you need to feel like some sense of stability when you go on stage. But if you're in a position where like you're not regularly performing, like right now for all of us, um, I would say this is absolutely the time to just try new things and, you know, see what sticks, see what feels good. Um, when I'm looking at setup too, I, I'm always analyzing like, can I do the things that I find hard to do on stage? That's, I think, a really good sign of a good setup, you know, High, really high up on the instrument or like virtuoso passages like do they feel easy or like easy with the setup that I have because if the answer is no then the setup is not right it's not really that important like how we, when we play something slow or romantic or like you know easy um we can play with many different setups I find like it's in terms of like short-term setup but when we start having to really get around the instrument that's I think when we really notice like if our setup isn't right or if we're playing for long periods of time so just being aware of like where you're tense at the end of the day too I find is very helpful like if I notice that I have like a lot of tension in my neck at the end of the day or something like that I might think well maybe my setup isn't quite right if I'm like slouching or all of these sorts of things so just being really aware on a daily basis it, it does change it, it adapts i changed my setup 
quite often actually. Not majorly, but like little adjustments. Great advice. Anyone else with a question? Louisa, did you have a question? Hey, um, thanks so much for today. It was really inspiring. Um, I just had a question because I'm learning a few pieces with piano at the moment, and obviously it's um, not possible to play with piano at the moment. I just wondered, do you have any tips for really internalizing like piano scores and accompaniments? And yeah, how do you go about that? So I'm guessing you don't have a piano. <laughs> um, I do, yeah. <laughs> oh, okay, then my my best advice is to to try and play it <laughs> or at least try and play it slowly very slowly and get really get to know the piano part read it read the score um you know understand when you're playing what the piano is doing i think that's kind of a very fundamental thing like when i'm playing sonatas i actually sometimes to a fault i would say i'm almost more listening to what the other person is doing than myself um so i think you know, being able to find some way of embodying that in your practice, you know, when we practice, we're so focused on just what we're doing, because there's nobody else there, as you just said, like, we can't be in a rehearsal with a pianist, so you can try things, like, sometimes I do this, like, I, I didn't do it much the last month or so, but I have done this in the past, is when you play a passage, and, like, try and sing the piano line, or, like, play a passage and just think about the piano, like think about what the other instrument's doing. Kind of similar to what we're talking about with singing at the same time, you know, anything that like gives you independence outside of yourself, like gives you control of like being able to take a step back from what you're doing and get into what other things are happening. It's not a question of necessarily being on autopilot with what you're doing, but mm. I think it's almost like a hyper sense of awareness of when you're able to focus on other things and trust that what you're doing is what you want it to do. <laughs> cool, that's really interesting. Thank you. It's so frustrating that we can't play with other people. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Chili, next. Uh, I was wondering if you have any tips for the uh, audition process for conservatories, because I'm going to be a senior next year, and I was wondering if you have any like advice for if I should be doing yeah. for prepare. Yeah, I think um, I would say a few things. I would say just the, the most obvious one is kind of preparation. Like, how do we prepare? You know, there's both like the practice, but also just how do we kind of mentally prepare for an audition process? Um, it's something I think we all have, you know, as violinists, we get frustrated with at different points. But I think a big thing for me that always helps with audition is not going into it expecting a certain outcome. So, or that you go into it thinking about the outcome. But, you know, when we go into a performance, you know, we're not thinking of an outcome so much as we are, we're just thinking about performing. So I would say that any audition that you have, don't think about like, you know, will I get it? Won't I get it? You know, what will they think of me? What won't they think of me? But really trying to get in the mindset of like, I'm delivering me, I'm communicating what I'm communicating. And that is really the only thing that matters. Um, one of the kind of deepest things I think that Mauricio Foots, the teacher that I studied with in Indiana, who's a wonderful teacher, taught me is, you know, when you give the audience the power to decide about you, you kind of take that away from yourself. And I think that it's the same with the audition process, you know, yes, they are deciding the outcome of that audition or that competition, but they're not deciding anything about you as a person, that, that stays exactly the same. And very keen to communicate the fact that whether you win an audition or a competition or not, you are exactly the same player. You're no worse and you're no better. <laughs> you're exactly the same player as you were before. So I think just remembering that really helps in auditions. Because I feel that sometimes when we don't get an audition or when, when things don't go well, the natural reaction, and I include myself in this, is to feel, you know, I'm now a worse player. Like I'm less of a player than I was before that process. So just remembering that you are exactly the same player, I think is a really good mentality to get into. That is absolutely a great way of putting that. That's exactly the problem, isn't it? And um, I always like to think that when you go into an audition situation, you, like you just have to represent yourself well. You have no idea what the panel is 
uh, priorities are, what they need. They may not even have an opening. They may have an opening for a particular kind of, of applicant and you're not that applicant. You don't know. All you can do is, is, is represent yourself, but, but adding to that, the feeling that no matter what happens, you're still you. That's, that's really, really wonderful. I hope you all take that to heart as I know there are a lot of auditions in your futures. So <laughs> anything else before we call it a day? I think that was just an amazing few hours of music making and and discussion. Thank you, Callum, so much for your time and your energy, your brilliant playing. And um, I can't wait until I actually meet you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> maybe, maybe we can play some some music together at some point. And um, thank you all for being here and for being a part of the class. It's a really terrific, terrific day. Um, just a little about the next, we have three more classes planned. I have, I've got classes planned through March. The next one is a, a change of direction. Um, Daniel Roberts of the Castalian Quartet, a dear friend of mine, is coming and we're going to have two string quartets and a violinist because I just couldn't leave the violinist out. So um, we're going to give give quartets on Zoom another try, one from um, from Manchester, one from Oberlin. And one of my students from the from the northern is going to play. So that's next week. Um, I can't, I'm so happy to be able to keep doing this, even though the circumstances are not great anywhere. But thank you, and we'll end the live stream.